Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news in Israel, so if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what in the Holy Land, have no worries. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and this is ILTV's Weekly Review. Well, it's official. The World Health Organization has now declared the coronavirus outbreak a pandemic in a move that's pushing many nations to take stronger action against protecting the public. Now, 100 Israelis have been diagnosed with coronavirus in the state of Israel, and 91 of them are in the hospital. Only three have already recovered from the disease. Well, the latest uptick of cases in Israel comes after the Israeli health ministry has just ruled out new restrictions to stop the spread of the virus. Public gatherings in Israel are now no longer allowed to have more than 100 people, which means as of now, Israelis are banned from going to most weddings and synagogue prayers. Schools are staying open for now, but universities should prepare for distance learning ahead of their possible closure. And anybody who has a fever or respiratory symptoms of any kind must now enter home quarantine until 48 hours after those symptoms have disappeared. The Defense Ministry has also announced that it will be extending closures of entry into Israel from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank city of Bethlehem in a bid to contain the virus. And hundreds of thousands of Israelis are currently in home quarantine, especially following the latest government order that every single person who's returned to Israel from abroad must enter 14 days of home quarantine. But when will this saga end? Well, it doesn't seem to be anytime soon. Israeli Culture Minister Miri Regev has now announced that for the first time in Israeli history, Israel's Independence Day torch lighting ceremony will be held without spectators. That's on April 28th, almost a month and a half away. Now, as more and more restrictions are placed on the public amid the coronavirus outbreak, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange has plummeted by more than 8 percent. And the Israeli government has now announced plans to supply just over $2.8 billion in so-called emergency first aid to the Israeli economy. These funds will be used as either loans to businesses or a cash injection to the health care system and other necessary services to the public. An estimated $1.13 billion of government money will be offered to Israeli businesses in the form of low-interest loans. About $280 million will be used to strengthen the health care system, and another $280 million will be used to bolster services like the Israeli police, fire and rescue services, and the prison services. Financial support is also going to be provided separately for the struggling aviation industry, which includes flagship Israeli airlines like El Al, Israel, and Al Kia. As of now, El Al has announced plans to place a whopping 80% of its 6,300 employees on unpaid leave, as the company expects to lose up to $160 million by April. Businesses applying for loans should be able to receive assistance from within seven to nine days. The Israeli finance minister says there also may be additional steps taken to strengthen the National Insurance Institute, which is tasked with helping the elderly and the growing number of workers that are being laid off. Israel's services exports are expected to see losses of $535 million, and exports of goods are expected to see losses of $366 million. Luckily, government officials are relatively unconcerned about shortages in food and raw materials, since most imports to Israel arrive by sea, and Israel is well placed to be able to feed its population with local produce. All right. Now, as Israel extends its restrictions surrounding the coronavirus, the Israeli economy is, of course, taking a hit. And that's why the Israeli government has now established a actually more than $1 billion fund to help local companies affected by the coronavirus crisis. נגיד בנק ישראל ואחרים, כדי להבטיח את חוסנו של המשק. המשק הישראלי במצב מצוין. אנחנו נכנסים למשבר הקורונה כשמצבנו טוב יותר מרוב מדינות העולם. נקטנו בצעדים, כמו הקמת קרן של 4 מיליארד שקל לעזור לעסקים שנפגעו מהקורונה. אנחנו עובדים בשעות אלה על הוספת כסף נוסף. About $570 million is going to be immediately designated to funding the support of small businesses, and the remaining cash will be provided later on. Airlines and tourism firms in Israel will be immediately assisted. As of now, nearly 4,000 workers are on unpaid vacation leave due to the coronavirus, and the Israeli Hotel Association says their industry is on the verge of collapse, with damages estimated to be at around 350 million shekels a month. 
Hotel occupancy rates have dropped by 40%, and Tel Aviv and Jerusalem are taking the brunt of the decline. Tour bus drivers are also concerned that they'll lose their jobs amid the worsening crisis. The Council for Honey Growers in Israel is also taking a hard financial hit due to the closure of entry for workers from the West Bank. But some businesses are benefiting from the crisis here in Israel. The Shufel Sal grocery store chain is trying to quickly recruit about 400 new employees to support the growing demand in grocery deliveries, as more and more people refuse to shop in public places. And Israel's Yes Cable Network has just launched a quarantine channel to help the thousands of Israelis in home quarantine pass the time more quickly. Yes says that they've noticed a 30% uptick in VOD viewing and has divided their new quarantine channel into four sections, dystopian series and movies, documentaries about viruses, what to watch in quarantine, which is more light fare shows like Modern Family, and Israelis in Quarantine, which is basically just Israeli TV series. We'll see how long the channel is going to last. Well, another group of Israelis have just tested positive for the coronavirus, bringing the total number of known cases in Israel up to 58 and counting. So now the Israeli government has just announced drastic measures to protect the country from the disease. Yeah, every single person who's returned to Israel from abroad must now go into two weeks of home quarantine. <laughs> אבל היא חיונית כדי לשמור על בריאות הציבור, ובריאות הציבור קודמת לפני הכל. ההחלטה הזאת תהיה בתוקף לשבועיים, במקביל אנחנו מקבלים החלטות לשמור על כלכלת ישראל. Non-Israeli citizens will be allowed to enter or stay in Israel for another 72 hours, but after that they will be barred completely from staying in Israel unless they can prove that they have a place to be quarantined in the country properly for at least 14 days. I was at the APAC policy conference. Uh, there uh, a week ago. I've been in the States for two weeks and a few hours before I left I heard that I'm gonna have to be stuck in my house for two weeks uh, which isn't exactly the best case scenario but uh, as we say uh, in Hebrew. Uh, we came from uh, Bansko in Bulgaria and we landed in Israel and we heard from the news that we need to be two weeks in our homes. Nobody told us in the, here in the airport uh, it's very sad because we're not going to work, not for study, uh, that's life. It's going to be difficult. Uh, I work, I usually need to travel around for work, which is obviously going to be uh, impossible. But uh, I'm pretty sure that my dog will be very happy. Now these measures are essentially placing Israel in isolation from the rest of the world and effectively shutting down tourism and are the most dramatic uh, responses to, the, to be introduced by any nation in the world. But there is good news among the dozens of Israelis that have been diagnosed with the coronavirus so far. Yeah, the most serious case, an East Jerusalem resident who is suffering from acute pneumonia and high fever, has now begun to stabilize. The 38-year-old bus driver chauffeured a group of Greek tourists around the country who were later found to be infected with the disease. Now, coronavirus has infected more than 110,000 people across the world and killed almost 4,000. The ultimate goal is to have home tests, just the way you do for pregnancy or HIV, that people can test themselves and when that happens we can narrow down considerably the uh, we can separate more effectively and efficiently healthy people from sick people this is good for health and it's very good for our economies because we're going to run into serious problems of uh, uh, mass quarantines that are not, uh, you can't run economies that Well, it's now been a week since Israel's landmark third serial election, and Prime Minister Netanyahu is commanding a majority bloc of 58 between the right and religious parties. So, declaring himself the winner, Netanyahu is working to attract those last three votes needed for a coalition, saying he's not going anywhere. Yeah, but while the Likud is the largest party in the Knesset now, the left under Benny Gantz has not given up. It's now been a week since Israel's landmark third serial election, and Prime Minister Netanyahu is commanding a majority bloc of 58 between the right and religious parties. So declaring himself the winner, Netanyahu is working to attract those last three votes that he needs for a coalition, explaining that he's not going anywhere. But while the Likud is the largest party, 
the left under Benny Gantz has not given up. While Prime Minister Netanyahu looks for the last few partners he needs to form a government, newly minted Knesset members opposed to Netanyahu are working to prevent him from succeeding. For one, with the Prime Minister's criminal trial set to begin March 17th, the opposition is looking to bar a person under indictment from serving as Prime Minister. Then at the same time, rival Blue and White Party chief Benny Gantz says he too is forming a coalition. Without revealing too much of the negotiations, Gantz says he intends to form a minority government consisting of his Blue and White Party, the Labour Gesher Meretz Party, and the Israel Beitenu Party under Avigdor Lieberman. Then they would get outside backing from the joint Arab list for a total of 62 seats. Until now though, the Blue and White Party had vowed not to form a government with the joint Arab list over vast differences in security policy, and so did Avigdor Lieberman. Gantz has already gone back on this promise, however, as the joint list now has 15 seats, making it impossible to form a coalition without them. And Lieberman is saying he'll recommend Gantz over anger at Prime Minister Netanyahu. Likewise, Gantz has already accepted a list of conditions for forming a government that Avigdor Lieberman has published to Facebook. Among them, increases to the elderly living stipends, allowing businesses and public transport to operate on the Sabbath, passing ultra-Orthodox draft laws to the military, and providing for easier conversions and civil marriage options. So the questions now are, will both the Arab list and Israel Beitenu come together behind Gantz? Will Netanyahu succeed in pulling together the last three votes he needs from the center and left-wing parties? And who will Rivlin choose first to try and prevent a fourth election. With politics, with the current yet unofficial results of the election, both left and right wing parties are claiming victory, but there are still some votes being tallied, and the Prime Minister's Likud party is holding out for a potential extra seat. Still, the Central Elections Committee is saying that there is no chance of that happening including potentially fraudulent ballots, which are being recounted, there are only just over a thousand votes left to review. Yet the Likud and other parties on the right are upwards of five to seven thousand votes shy of another Knesset seat. So in spite of the Likud's arguing to the contrary, the Central Elections Committee says these results are just not going to change. That means that the Likud is settled with 36 seats within a block of 58, opposite the blue and white parties 33 seats within the center left and Arab bloc of 59 to 62. And with this math in mind, President Rivlin is expected to give the first chance to form a coalition to Blue and White Chairman Benny Gantz. Again, though, this is assuming two things. One, that both Avigdor Lieberman and the Arab List will agree to form Gantz's minority government, in which the Arab parties prop up the coalition from outside. And two, that the Blue and White Party itself will be content with such a change in policy. And neither seem likely at this time. While Gantz has agreed to the secular and economic conditions set forth by Avigdor Lieberman, he has yet to even hear the demands of the Arab Joint List. And even if Gantz is okay with their demands, whatever they are, members of his party, like sub-party chief Moshe Yalon and MK's Tzvi Hauser and Yoaz Hendel, reportedly refuse to rely on the majority Arab faction. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Netanyahu's requests to postpone the election results have been rejected, and the Central Elections Committee chairman is now handing over the official final results to the President Reuven Rivlin. So with that, the time to negotiate a government has finally begun again. But given the results of this third consecutive election, many are already updating their next campaign strategies. Prime Minister Netanyahu is catching heavy criticisms right now for already planning for fourth elections. After all, President Rivlin hasn't even met with party leaders for recommendations following third elections. But Netanyahu may be onto something, because the numbers don't lie and they're looking really bleak. With a right-wing bloc that is very unlikely to grow beyond its current 58 seats, all eyes have been on the opposition, and Blue and White Party Chairman Benny Gantz has been hard at work trying to gather enough supporters for a minority government, or a coalition consisting of his own party, the Labour Gesher Meretz Party, and Avigdor Lieberman's Israel Beitenu Party, with outside support from the Arab Joint List. But while this unpopular plan really seems like the only way to avert fourth elections at this time, it's not sitting well with several key members of the left. Blue and White MKs Yoaz Hendel and Svi Hauser have officially come out against the plan, and now so has Labour Gesher Meretz Chair MK Ori. Levi Abkassis. She calls the idea a broken promise to voters and a shameful violation of basic norms and values. The majority Arab joint list party is the third largest faction commanding 15 Knesset seats, but many members, past and present, have been embroiled in controversy involving support for Palestinian terrorism and other anti-Israel positions. Still, President Rivlin reminds us that the language used against the Arab majority parties is not appropriate for modern democracy, and that in Israel, all votes count the same. So are we doomed to fourth elections, though? Well, the time for the 2030 Knesset isn't up just yet, and one other option also remains on the table if party leaders are willing to consider it. President Rivlin's previously suggested rotational unity government made up of the Likud and the blue and white parties.
On the International Criminal Court is soon set to decide on whether or not it has the jurisdiction to prosecute Israel and the United States over allegations of war crimes. Israel and the United States, though, are coordinating their responses to the world body. An Israeli delegation is returning to Israel from Washington this week after talks about the ICC in the White House, and the two allied nations are coordinating their responses to potential charges of war crimes for alleged actions against the Palestinians and in Afghanistan. Now, the International Criminal Court is set up to prosecute war crimes and crimes against humanity in cases where UN member states are either unwilling or unable to investigate themselves. And for now, the ICC's pre-trial chamber is weighing whether it has the right to hear cases from East Jerusalem, God Gaza and the West Bank. Israel and the United States argue that they have credible legal systems, however, and do not require outside intervention. Likewise, ICC member states, including Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Uganda, Brazil, Australia, and Canada, are all submitting briefs on Israel's behalf. But most importantly, neither Israel nor the United States are members of the ICC, posing a problem for any potential plaintiffs. And in fact, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo even calls the ICC a renegade so-called court that was designed to go after rogue regimes and not institutions like America. All right, now for some other political news, let's head over to the states where former Vice President Joe Biden has now taken a commanding lead in the Democratic primaries. To all those who have been knocked down, to all those who have been counted out, left behind, this is your campaign. Just over a week ago, many of the pundits declared that uh, this candidacy was dead. Now we're very much alive. Well, you heard the man what was once believed to be a lost cause is now the strongest campaign against President Trump in the coming 2020 elections. And the news comes at the heels of the Democratic primary results coming from Michigan, Missouri, and Mississippi. But Michigan was essentially the linchpin in the Bernie Sanders campaign with 125 delegates on the table. And Sanders famously won in Michigan against candidate Hillary Clinton before the swing state uh, later narrowly voted for President Trump in the 2016 elections. Still, Sanders may be trailing behind Biden's 823 delegates with just 663 nominations of his own. 1,991 delegate votes are needed to become the Democratic Party's nominee in 2020. And there are several dozen more states that have yet to cast their votes, so for now, it's still either one's game. All right, now as panic spreads amid the coronavirus outbreak, there is some hope coming out of Israel, and ILTV's Nittany Manson has the details. As panic spreads amidst the coronavirus outbreak, there is some hope coming out of Israel. Is a vaccine for coronavirus just around the corner? That could be the case in Israel, where a vaccine for the virus is on track to be ready for testing within just a few weeks, although it likely won't be available for months because of lengthy bureaucratic testing and approval. The oral vaccine for adults and children could turn the disease into a very mild cold. The state-funded Migal Galilee Research Institute has been working for the last four years towards developing a vaccine that could be customized for various viruses, and it's now being adapted to focus on corona. Israel's science ministry made headlines last month when they said a vaccine could be just three months away, but the health ministry doesn't want to spread false hope. The vaccine will consist of a specially produced protein that needs to go through clinical testing for at least 30 days and then human trials for another 30, before going through the process of government approval. A solution to the virus is in dire need, especially given the new results from a U.S. study. Findings by John Hopkins University say that most people infected with the coronavirus will show symptoms within five days, and almost everyone will be symptomatic by day 12. But the big issue is that the virus is contagious before the symptoms even appear, making it extremely difficult for authorities to contain the pathogen in time. All right, so Aaron, I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more I feel like my memory is getting worse. Uh, well, that may just because, you know, we've learned to be selective with what we want to remember. It's, uh, you know, it's called wisdom that comes with age a little bit. I wouldn't really know, but I, I've heard that that's what it's called. <laughs> I didn't say that. You said that. Uh, it's fair, but there is some good news. Israeli researchers say that they have the key to boosting the memory processes in your brain. Are you ready for this, Aaron? It better be good. <laughs> okay, sniffing roses. Scientists from Tel Aviv University and the Weizmann Institute of Science say that sniffing roses bolsters your memory. All right, explain. How is this possible then? Okay, so in their study, participants were exposed to the scent of roses when they were asked to remember the location of words presented on either the left or right sides of a computer screen, and when they were tested on their memory of the word locations both before and after taking a nap at the lab, 
uh, they were surrounded by the scent of roses. But during the nap, the roses were administered again, and this time to only one nostril. Now, EEG scans show that the one-sided rose scent delivery led to different sleep waves in the two hemispheres of the brain. All right, and I'm guessing that the side of the brain that received the rose scent had better memory of the words presented? Exactly. So their findings basically reveal that our memory process can be amplified by external cues like scents, which so makes sense. So it's not necessarily the roses that are helping memory. Maybe not, but I still could use some by my bedside table. I will say that, but it's interesting that we, you know, we relate what we smell to specific memories, so it would make sense that if function, we want to remember yeah. something, we should relate that to a specific scent. You heard, you heard it. And now, in an incredible partnership program, a pair of NFL football players have just been given a crash course in what it means to be an IDF soldier. And while these two athletes are at the top of their game, it turns out that there's always more to learn. Washington Redskins running back Adrian Peterson and cornerback Josh Norman, who just reportedly signed with the Buffalo Bills, are now returning from Israel after a very unique experience. The pair, who played together for two years, first arrived in Israel as participants in the International First Robotics Competition and in partnership with RoboActive 2069, an Israeli high school organization. But after the competition, they also participated in training exercises with the IDF, running obstacle courses with soldiers, taking lessons in Kav Maga, and even receiving military briefs on the threats against Israel. So how was it? Well, Norman says that it's amazing to get in there and train with the IDF because they're at the top of their game of being in combat, and Peterson is amazed by the soldiers' mental toughness and focus. As for the exercise that stood out the most, the players say running up a hill with 40-pound vests, which apparently feels like running in sand, tops the list. Now finally, while this was Peterson's first visit, Norman is no stranger to the Holy Land. He's visited three or four times already, wears a chai or life necklace, and is even considering moving here. And of course, both he and Peterson say they'd return to continue their philanthropy too. Now, to learn more about their philanthropy, make sure to check out Adrian Peterson's A and A Peterson Family Foundation and Josh Norman's Star 20, Stars Twenty Four Foundation. They're both absolutely amazing organizations that promote youth empowerment and development. That's it for ILTV's weekly review. See you next week.